I think that mannering to others also functions um, in another way uh, that for most of our projects, we need others to validate, to adjudicate uh, that what we're doing is actually matters, actually is important. Rebecca, it's great to see you. Unfortunately, we're all uh, dealing with uh, COVID, uh, sheltering in place, uh, grandkids can't go to school, so much suffering in the world. But, but here's my question for you. Uh, secretly, uh, as writers, aren't we a little bit happy uh, that we have an excuse not to go out with friends or meet relatives so we can stay at home and focus on all the things we're doing? I just wish the world wasn't quite as interesting as it is right now because I find it overwhelmingly <laughs> massively distracting. I find <laughs> politics too distracting. I find, you know, all of these crises um, very distracting. And uh, so I confess my concentration hasn't been what I would like it to be. Well, I like the idea that before, in order to talk to you, and I love talking to you, the last time I had to either fly to Boston or Tucson, now all I have to do is roll out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is a good thing. <laughs> so t tell me about your, uh, your your latest project. I know it's in, in development and it has to, it, it revolves around the word matter, uh, mattering, which is a, a fascinating word. And I'd like to explore that a bit. Yeah, it... It is such, I think that in that one word are all of my obsessions, the nature of matter. <laughs> and, um, you know, because I had begun in physics and that was my major obsession to figure out the nature of matter and how it can produce consciousness. Um, and I know that you share that, that obsession. And, um, and then I think that, you know, that it's, it's not an accident that we have this normative concept to matter, um, this verb, uh, which, is, which is normative. Um, it entails obligations and it comes from that word matter. Uh, and and I, I think, you know, my, the first half of my career was very involved in that first meaning, the noun meaning of matter. Um, and, uh, and now it seems uh, the remainder is very given over to the verb, to matter, and um, and uh, how we came to be creatures who care so much about what matters and about who matters, and in particular whether one's own self matters. So I hear really two radically different kinds of meanings for the word matter, which is a. a peculiarity of our English language, one matter in terms of stuff that's out there, um, and the other is what it means to matter um, in, in, a, uh, in terms of a meaningful uh, uh, kind of way. Uh, and you're, uh, you're talking about uh, ma the, the second kind of matter in a very broad sense as, as almost, uh, you talk about the story of what makes us human. In other words, you're taking the second kind of matter as the, as the sort of the, the fundamental you know, psychosocial uh, foundation of, of humanity. Yeah, I, it's, it's a big claim. I think I've been going towards it for a very long time, working out the details. But, you know, you put your finger right on it. I do think that what accounts for this, our species, uh, a strange uniqueness, <laughs> um, the way that the achievements that we can lay claim to and the atrocities that we can lay claim to, um, all derive from a deep longing uh, in each of us to matter, uh, to not be as nothing, to, to to feel as if we, uh, to justify all of the attention that we pay to ourselves. I mean, any living creature has to pay a lot of attention to itself uh, in order to survive and to flourish. 
um, and it has to uh, care tremendously about its own flourishing. Um, but, and we're programmed for that. All, all living creatures are, you know, from the grass, you know, struggling up through the concrete to, to us. Um, but we are, and I think um, because it's brought to us by the largeness of our brains that didn't develop for this reason, but it is a spandrel, as they say, of this uh, evolution, um, the big brain, uh, the cognitive niche that we, that we fill. Um, that we can actually step outside of our lives and look at our lives. That's what the whole sense of the absurdity that the existentialists wax so eloquent about yeah. and, uh, and say, do we, do I really matter? Is, am, am, am I like a dog chasing its own uh, tail hair? Um, you know, is, 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 is this life really absurd? And a tremendous longing that it not be absurd. Uh, and so we, we conceive these various projects and there's where the great diversity among us enters in diversity that often causes a great deal of hostility among us because so much is riding on it. So much emotional intensity is riding on it. But these projects that we form, whether secular or religious, whether intellectual or, or artistic or devotion to the people we love, whatever it is, that have a justificatory role to play in our lives that are ultimately trying to demonstrate uh, that we matter. So let me try to dissect the, the kind of matter that we're talking about. And this is kind of off the cuff, so you're gonna, we're going to kind of develop this together. So one kind of matter that you started with is what matters to me as a, a living organism, which arguably in some broader sense would be the same as a paramecium, uh, that I need to have food, I need to have some kind of homeostasis, reproduce, all of those kinds of things. So very much inward what I matter, to, what matters to me to, to make me, my organism work. Second kind I, I hear is some sort of an interrelationship matter. How can I matter to the other, however the other is broadly defined? And then I'd have a third, you know, is there a, a matter with a capital M, uh, you know, a big matter that's out there? Maybe there's none, uh, but, uh, you know, arguably. Now, it would seem that the first is common to all living organisms. Um, the second, arguably, humans may be unique, but could be other kinds of creatures, uh, could, you know, uh, primates, uh, cetaceans, various, could have similar kinds of mattering interrelationship. And then the big M, humans do seem to be unique in seeking that. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. I, I think that that intermediate mattering, mattering to others, um, you know, it seems to me that, uh, um, I mean, one of the ways in which we can try to demonstrate our mattering of the third type, the big M, uh, what really matters, um, is to matter to others, uh, and for others to matter to us. Um, I think there's a very good argument for that, and it might be the most sustainable way uh, as well. It might be um, the most satisfying uh, in the long run. That's an empirical question. Uh, but um, I think that mattering to others also functions um, in a, another way uh, that for most of our projects, we need others to validate, to adjudicate uh, that what we're doing is actually matters actually is important. And this varies from project to project. Um, so a religious core project, you know, is uh, there, you, other mortals don't particularly matter. You're, you're looking for the big, the big other, um, other with a capital O to adjudicate, you know, to ratify that you matter. I spent a lot of my life among mathematicians. Math was my first love and the place, you know, that I, I, I still have very strong ties. 
And math, the mathematical projects are very, very interesting because they're, they are like other projects that I know of, some games and, and such, self-adjudicating. You know if you do something important in mathematics. You know what is it, what, everybody knows, you know, what, what is a deep problem in math. Um, and when you've solved something absolutely significant, and I've noticed among mathematicians, um, you know, there is less reliance on the adjudication of others. Um, I guess uh, Gregory Perlman is a, is, a, is a perfect example, you know, of this, solved a tremendously important problem, was offered the highest prize in mathematics, went off into the forest, he couldn't care less, right? He had solved the important problem. And so it didn't, you know, so the, these things vary. Um, these projects vary in terms of how important others are. Um, so, so many times when I start talking about this and people, when I say matter and people will, and I've noticed actually there might be a slight gender difference here. Women more often than men will say, well, mattering to others, that's mm -hmm. what matters. No, I don't care about that. <laughs> you know, um, but I spend so much time among mathematicians that I say, well, not to everybody, believe it or not. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's your involved in a project in which other other human beings are not terrifically important. Um, that could be a religious project. It could be a secular project. I, I'm hearing matter related to the concept of meaning because as you know, closer to truth is, is organ or organized around three big topics, uh, cosmos, cosmology, physics, mathematics, consciousness, brain, mind stuff, and that's what we've engaged in in the past. And the third category, meaning, we've also talked about that, the existence of God and problem of evil, all of those kinds of issues that we characterize under meaning. So I want to ask you, the f you're, you're creating this new idea of, of longing uh, to, to matter. And I just want to ask you how that articulates with the more common phrase uh, of searching for meaning. So how is longing to matter relate to searching for meaning? Yes. So I, um, that question of searching for meaning has always, uh, it's always baffled me. Um, and now I think I understand when, when we're, we're looking for the meaning, you know, the, the singular meaning, it seems to me what we are looking for, the question posed is, is the universe such? Is there a metaphysical truth about the universe that not only justifies us, but justifies um, how hard it is to, to live a human life? The suffering, the tragedy that's woven into living a human life, you know, knowing, losing people, knowing we will die, all of these things, the frustrations, contemplating what, whether we matter. Uh, and um, so the meaning of life is asking something of the universe. Is it out there? Is there an important truth such that discovering it will reconcile me to life? And maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, religion claims that there is, but you don't have to be religious. I mean, Buddhism, whether it's a religion or not, I, you know, who knows, but the claim that the self is an illusion, that would be such a important claim, a metaphysical claim that could reconcile one's, oneself to suffering. Um, and, um, And you know, my view is very skeptical. I'm open to it. I think it's a meaningful question. Um, is the universe like this? I once believed it was, you know, having started out as a very religious person, I came to the point of view that it's not. But that didn't relieve me of this question, which I think is just built into our, our minds, um, comes along with the big brainness that we have. Uh, do I matter? What's the best way? Well, what is it to live a life that's worthy of a human being to live? That's the oldest question. That's Socrates' question. 
Rebecca, in this context, I want to read to you a quote that you've used that has been one of the the kind of the motivating uh, ideas of, of Closer to Truth in my life. And, and I, I saw it resonate and it's from Bertrand Russell. I want to read it. All the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. Why do you use that quote? Well, I think, um, I mean, that it's my view, actually. I think that that is true, but it doesn't relieve me of the great desire to live as well as I possibly can to devote myself to a project that is, can matter, that can help other you know, people uh, in this, tremendous trial of what it is to to live a human life and to ask these kinds of questions and to face the very real possibility that Bertrand Russell is pointing out, right? We, we're still going to try to flourish and we're still going to, we're not going to give up. I, you know, the more I um, think about these things, you know, the more sympathy I have for just what it is to be human. Mm. Um, as foolish and often egregious of, as the mistakes are that we make in trying to assert, to prove our mattering. And I think many of the greatest horrors of history come from these egregious fallacies of this sort. Um, still, you know, it's, there's, a, there's, there's just a sympathy um, that, that dwells up in me. Um, yeah, that's a great word, sympathy. It wouldn't have ordinarily come to mind, uh, but... Yeah. A very evocative word. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.